Hello, everybody in the audience and on Facebook Live. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Psy Cafe here at Kaust. I'm John Tanachi. I'll be your moderator for this event. Uh, this event is a little bit special, a little bit different than previous Psy Cafes. We've tied it into the Fall Enrichment Program, where the theme, of course, is Designing Tomorrow, which is you know, futuristic and, and forward thinking, but focused on that element of design. How is Apple able to get us to keep buying their products? That sort of thing. Um, what we want to try and do is connect that design element uh, to some of the research that's happening at KAUST. A lot of what we do here at KAUST is we observe how nature operates uh, at high temperatures, at very fast speeds, uh, at very small length scales. And we try and utilize that um, in our own design of new products and new applications. So we have three experts. We're going to ask them some questions and, and talk about that sort of connection between their science, their observations, and how they try and design new applications. Uh, so the format of this is very easy. You're going, to get, you're going to hear from each of these panelists a brief introduction professionally. How did they pick their field? How did they get there? You know, what, what excites them about their field? I'll ask a few questions so that you know the background, you know what they do, you know what they're an expert in. You can kind of put them into a bucket so you know what questions to ask them. And then after that, in about 15 minutes, I need you to have thought up some questions. I'm going to come back to you, and the audience has to carry the rest of the conversation. That's the challenge to you guys. We all okay with that? Good. All right, so I'll start with Deanna. And again, the, the first round of this is just to introduce who they are and what do they do here at KAUST. Hello. So uh, I'm Deanna Lacoste. I'm an assistant professor at the Clean Combustion Research Center. And uh, uh, my background is uh, combustion science and plasma physics. So I started to work in combustion first because I was passionate by engines. And then I discovered plasma, plasma discharges, sparks, electricity. It was great. So, and then I tried to combine the both of them. So this was the fun part, but uh, uh, a way to, to present my research in terms of um, globally what I'm doing, I, I try to help uh, for the design of the next generation of gas turbine uh, by using first the approach of plasma assisted combustion and second trying to uh, completely change uh, the way we think about the, the gas turbine. Yeah. And just to translate for those of you that aren't in the field, turbine generally is power generation then. Very large scale, very high temperature, pressure, uh, generating large amounts of energy. So we'll get into a few of the details of, of how do you design something like that later on. Uh, Jesper, you want to say something about your background? Yeah, I'll say something. So I'm Jesper, so formerly I'm a professor here in uh, bioscience at BZ and also a professor in computer science here. So how did I get here? Uh, well, to make a long story short, first, when you're a kid, you wake up, you start to wonder about things. How do things work? You look up in the stars, you look at your hand, you start to think about things. So in my case, that meant you read a lot of things. You study mathematics, you study physics, philosophy, and all that. But then you start to become interested in what is the difference between sort of dead matter versus living matter. So I became very interested in that. So then I went to med school, did a PhD there and in neuroscience actually. So along this way, which may seem a bit odd, I, ha I think I had three books that really inspired me in terms of thinking about these things because I believe that fundamental understanding is a prerequisite for designing and developing applications. And one, two minutes. Uh, so the books were, of course, Schrodinger's What is Life, 1944. He asked two questions, the coding of genetic information, but secondly, also the stability of a cell and, and systems. How come that these atoms doesn't fall apart? How can they be stable? And that is still a sort of very important question. The second book uh, was from Neumann, the brain and, and the computer and the brain was very interesting sort of discussion about mathematics and living cells, how to think about that. And the third one, of course, to recommend is Gödel Lecher Bash, which is a very intertwined sort of story about these different fields. So that really inspired me to go after living systems, and in particular small things here, cells, to really understand cells in a fundamental way. And that is sort of related to design as well. So I think the take home lesson is that follow your own path, your own interests. And secondly, popular science books are sometimes very sort of important. So <laughs> take a look on them. Good. Sigi, want to give a little bit of your background? Yes. Um, is this one? Yeah. yeah. So uh, my name is Sigi Thoratsen. I'm uh, originally from Iceland. 
So I, you can call me a Viking. I, I've <laughs> traveled all around the world, uh, pillaging and uh, robbing the best uh, possibilities, best opportunities I could find. Right? So I did my undergraduate in Iceland, and I went to the US for a PhD and master's in PhD. And then I sailed all the way around the world to Singapore, <laughs> National University of Singapore, where I was a professor, before coming here as one of the founding faculty in 2009 when we opened up the... So my field is uh, experimental fluid mechanics. So what is that? Fluids is, uh, you know, bubbles, drops, multi-phase flow, flow how, how does oil flow in pipelines, etc. So I've been studying uh, fluid mechanics and focusing on the very uh, finest details. So Kaust has been very uh, generous to, to supply me or le let me build a world-class, probably the best equipped laboratory in the world here to study these kind of flows using high-speed images and I can high-speed video cameras and I can uh, talk about that more later. Very good. I like the Viking reference. <laughs> Pillaging technologies and resources. Um, uh, uh, along those lines, I, I want to stick with Siggy. You'll see that we're going to try and uh, categorize these three panelists. So. I would put Siggy on one end of the spectrum in terms of extreme observation, really understanding what are the laws of nature, uh, and, and, and going all the way down this line, I would say that Deanna is a bit more applied in terms of designing new engines. But we want you to understand the, the perspective of what each of them does uh, in order for you to frame your questions. So Siggy, maybe you can say a little bit about the time scales and the details that you investigate in terms of observing how nature is designed. Yes, thank you. So uh, I have a, a camera in my lab that they can take 5 million frames per second. That's the frame rate. Right? So people ask me, why do you need such a high frame rate? You're just looking at drops. They don't move so fast. Right? I have a demo here, actually, <laughs> which kind of highlights this fact. Right? Oh. So everybody knows about peeling tape. If you've been moving house or something, you've been doing this. And it's very annoying, this sound, right? Isn't this <laughs> annoying? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, I have been studying where, this, where does this sound come from, right? It turns out you need one million frames per second just to figure out how this is generated. Uh, now, I didn't start just to study the sound. Uh, it's very interesting when you peel tape, there's actually light generated. If you are in a very dark room, you can see uh, with masking tape, you can see very weak blue light generated. And some scientists have found out that actually x-rays are generated. So how is this happening? I thought this would be very interesting to see. And uh, actually, you need one million frames per second to see that. <laughs> and the, the way it happens is that you have a stick-slip mechanism. So this is a very basic thing that shows up in many uh, physical processes, like, for example, earthquakes. You know, they're sticking, and then oh, it slips. And the slips in here are actually not, the tape is not slipping this way. There are these tiny fractures that are going sideways. Chup, 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 chup. And they're going so fast that uh, they are supersonic, the fracture moves supersonically across the tape. Sonic boom. And that's what you're hearing when you hear this. Yeah. And uh, you needed one million frames per second to see that. And other phenomena in fluid mechanics uh, require that. So if you understand the basics, you know, you could use that in your design of engines, etc. Maybe you can give a few examples from, from droplets or from friction that that you've observed that then become applications that involve some design from the fundamental principles? Yeah. Um, well, for example, if you are uh, using inkjet printers, and you, you're using inkjet printers to print uh, screens on cell phones or something, you do not want the drops that are printing on the screen to entrap little air bubbles underneath them. This process actually is very, very fast. So we've been using the 5 million frames per second in my lab to see how little air pockets are entrapped underneath the drop. Right? So uh, 
this is, I know this has been a problem in some of the manufacturing uh, of displays, right? Very good. So understanding, uh, you know, do you have to do this in a vacuum or how do you get rid of these air bubbles? First, you have to understand where they come from. And uh, we've been doing very basic work uh, in the last couple of years on understanding how the air right underneath the droplets can't ca get away and it's captured. Right? That's good. one example. All right, so I, I want Jesper to explain a little bit about what he studies and the applications, but I want to read from his website because it's a fascinating line to me. He says that part of his research, guided by theory, is asking, what defines the identity of a cell? Which is, uh, I think, a pretty complicated question, so maybe you can say some more about that, Jesper. Uh, we can't answer that yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are also very, very dependent on technology to study these cells and we are very interested in cells or systems of cells. Why is that? Because that is the basic building block of every living system we know about. So that's clearly interesting to study them and we try to observe them in a very careful detail. And since the Human Genome Project was sort of finished 15 years ago, technology has been developing over time so we can have a higher, higher resolution on what happens in a system of cell or nowadays in, in single cells. We can observe what happens in cells in terms of different molecules. The DNA we know about is fairly fixed, but also the regulation of how the DNA is used, RNA molecules and proteins and metabolites and how cells are responding to changes in the environment. So we can study that with higher and higher precision using imaging, using next generation sequencing, but still, then the data is very complicated. So what we do in practice is we do experiments, but we also do a lot of computational techniques to understand this data, machine learning techniques and bioinformatics to make sense of that. So observing these cells in higher and higher position is kind of what drives us to address these kind of questions. What is the cell? What is the identity of the cell? And what we have been learning in the last five, seven years is that this concept of identity is a bit fluent because cells can be reprogrammed. You can move cells from being a skin cell into a stem cell and to other cells. So it's not clear how many cell types we do we have in the body and uh, how can we reprogram and engineer tissue. So technology and computation is very important to, to study this. And, and at least three aspects of this that goes into design. One obviously is the medical domain in terms of better diagnostic, better understanding diseases, and that will in the end, I think, redesign how we think about healthcare and, and uh, hospitals and that. The second line is uh, the fundamental research of understanding cells, finding these roadmaps. Then we can start to have an engineering control of cells, similar to like in material science, where we understand atoms and systems of atoms. We can start to engineer and control systems. And that is the possibility which has been opened now by new technology. So we can really understand these very, very complicated roadmaps with thousands of molecules. So we can control the cells in, in disease states or also for engineering tissue. And the third one, which is more blue sky thing, is that what I believe that we can learn a lot of things by observing nature very carefully. And in the context of cells, we can learn, I believe, principles for how evolution has found very good solutions on how to build these things they, to be adaptable, they can learn things in systems of cells. So most likely we can find ideas about new ways of computing from these very detailed microscopic understanding and that will also design the next generation I think of computers in the future and on a grander scheme we can see convergence between the IT world and the bio world and we don't know where that will lead us. So these are three sort of design avenues. Maybe you can say a little bit more because this is related to synthetic biology and, and the idea that uh, sometimes in that field you actually treat the cell as if it's a circuit that you can design and that you can engineer. So maybe you can... Yeah, so, so uh, that was, I, I spent my time as a postdoc in Boston too many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, uh, or with one of the founders of synthetic biology and it was kind of an engineering concept. So instead of observing a system only, a very complicated system, let's make it simple, like in engineering. So you can take a bacteria, you can take part of the genome, and you can design a circuit. So you design a string of DNA, and you engineer what that circuit should do. 
Should it be like a switch or like an oscillator? So you engineer a circuit, you have equations, you understand it perfectly. Uh, so then you can start to do like in electronics, you can build gates, you can build more and more complicated computations. And why would you do that? You don't build a new computer because it's too slow, but you can use that as devices for sensing things within the body and also for drug delivery. So you have sensors which are very sort of precise, sense the molecules in your body, and then triggers a function here. So this, again, it's an example where engineering and biology are sort of two sides of the same coin, I would say. I think that's a very interesting development. All right, cool. All right, again, this is all setting the stage so you can ask questions. That's the important part. So after Deanna talks for a couple more minutes, it's, it's on you to ask some entertaining questions of the panelists. So maybe you can say a little bit, Deanna, about what it takes to engineer something on the scale of a, of a turbine for power generation. Yeah, so um, a turbine is, uh, I don't know if how familiar you are with a turbine, <laughs> but it's a big system. Uh, it's a combustion system, it's based on the uh, uh, energy released by a combustion process. Uh, we can find gas turbine in power plant for electricity generation or in the main part of the aircraft. So the, the aircraft engine are gas turbines. And uh, uh, to develop such a new system, you need something like about 10 years from the first ID to the sell of the, the first product. And the cost of this development is something around 2 billion US dollars. And when you sell your first product, the gas turbine will be used by during something between 20 and 40 years. So when you propose a new ID, when you propose something new, you have to be sure about what you are doing, <laughs> because otherwise it can be a big, a big problem if um, you have something wrong or if your technology is not robust or if it's not re reliable over the next 20 or 30 years. And in addition, you need to think what will, what will be the future of, uh, of this engine. So how, how do you take a system so big yeah. and so complex and, and, and just focus on a couple variables or design something very specific? How do you break that down? So in, in my group, we have two different approaches. So the first one, for example, is that at the current situation, uh, there are a few problems with the current gas turbine. So I pick up one that I think it's important, not only me, but the community think it's an important problem. And this problem is called thermoacoustic instability. So it's a problem of instability of the flame that coupled with the acoustic mode of the chamber. You and can't control the explosion, that's what she's saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, we try to find a way to avoid problem with this coupling. Yeah. And uh, uh, I try to use um, a specific kind of plasma discharges to solve this problem. And if this is working, maybe we will have a new plasma actuator in the next generation of gas turbine in five or ten years. So plasma is a superheated state of matter that is helping yep. to control these explosions, for lack of a better description. Yeah, absolutely. So a plasma discharge is, is a spark. So probably uh, in a car engine, if you have a spark plug, you can see some little spark or also some igniter for the, for the lighter. You have also some sparks or lightning during uh, storms. It's also a kind of spark. Very good. Okay. Does that give you enough of a background? Now it's on you guys. What do you want to know from the panelists in terms of either their research or more importantly on the topic? How are they taking their research? What are they designing? What are the applications? What's What's interesting to you? Any questions? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I guess I have this magical throwing mic, which is, sounds like trouble to me. Are you ready? OK. Oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> uh, good evening, all of the panel. My name is Dr. Iftikhar. I'm from the King of Aziz University, Rabi. So my background is a biological and science. So I'm working on the computation biologists, most on the NGS and uh, SNPs, uh, SNP based uh, things. My question is about that, the following the unprecedented data flow of the proteins and genomes and proteomes, how we can lead uh, you know, to design such a system because I was, I lead up confusion, you know, daily basis we have a new technology coming up, like we say the omics of science, the transcriptome, this and this. And this unprecedented flow of the data we are having, and why do we are leading to you know, design so that we can have a benchmark, okay, we have to do this focus on the particular area. My question is that how we are going through with this kind of data flow. Thank you very much. Go ahead, yes, sir. 
I guess that question is for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a gap here in the sense that we can have very good technology right now for observing lots of different layers of regulation within cells and between cells. We can observe and we can record and we can collect large amounts of data. We can do some measurement of intervention. We can sort of alter the genome using CRISPR techniques, for example, or we can knock out some genes or perturb the system to some degree. But still, we have a very large system. And then we look at this data, what to do with that. Now, if you take the perspective from physics, why have physics been so successful? Because in essence, people have been able to figure out generative models. Newton's equations is one example of that. You have a few number of equations that can explain a large number of different observations. So that's a big divide, I would say, how we think in biology versus how we think in physics. So the challenge, as I see it, is that how do we go from observation and build models. Now we understand that we cannot do this in a handcrafted way because there's so much we don't understand, there are still things we can't measure. So what we need, and this is the connection not only to bioinformatics but more to sort of machine learning approaches, we need to develop systems that are clever enough that can look on the data and then generate not one model but ensembles of generative models that can explain this data and those models we can test and intervene and come up with very precise new experiments. But I think there's a divide between observation science and data analytics versus predictive sort of generative modeling here. And this is a very important gap. Unless we can close this gap, we will not be able to control these complicated systems, cells with thousands of genes active and large number of proteins, where to look at. It's, in, it's like a needle in a haystack. But most likely, since cells are stable, atoms doesn't disappear, as sort of Schrodinger feared. There are regularities in the systems, and these are the regularities we have to go after. So we have to have that in mind. That's sort of my perspective of this. And this requires not only new technology, it also requires new ideas, new algorithms, new concepts here, to think in a different way here, like more like an engineering kind of way. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Next question. Can I ask one from, uh, of course. Okay. Any parent toe would like to know if you can create packaging that doesn't make a sound because she finds it really annoying during the movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, well, if you can change the adhesive, you know, to, and uh, open it more slowly, it, I'm sure it's possible. Some of these uh, Scotch tape, actually, when I was doing this work, I, I went to the department store and I bought every type of tape I could find, you know. And some of them didn't make sound, you know. They just would peel off very nicely. But I don't think they work very well, you know. <laughs> so it's a trade-off, you know. Do you want your thing to stick together or you want to make sound? I, I just want to comment on that. Think of how resourceful he is as a professor. Part of his research, he has five million frames per second cameras in his lab, and he goes to the hardware store and buys every type of tape off, off the wall and, and tests it under his system. So. Any other questions? Yes. The microphone. Oh. <laughs> it's coming. I don't trust my throat that far. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for this panel. <clears throat> Just a question. B probably it is common between the three. What is the role of uh, reinforcement learning, uh, deep learning, and quantum mechanics to do all this business? Because you are running into big data, mm. big size of data. Thank you. Do you want to tackle that one first, yes, Yeah, so um, I think if you take the example of deep learning, I think that is one example of where we learn something from nature, how to compute in the different ways, in specifically how the visual cortex, for example, is organized in different layers. We can have inspiration from that to come up with new ways of computing, but it's still very far off. It's referred to as supervised learning. You need lots of training examples, and we usually don't have that much data in biology. So we need, that said, we need to do research in new kind of learning things, and especially unsupervised uh, learning techniques 
to actually look at this data and not just unsupervised learning techniques to describe the data, but making the leap from an unbiased description of the data to generative models. And that is not something that exists today. So we need to do research and, and figure out how we can design these sort of new smart machines. And so, so that's an example of how these living systems forces us to think about entirely new problems where we have to go to another domain in order to work there and then apply that back to this biology system. And reinforcement learning hasn't been used that much so far, mostly in the context of games. Um, so that raises the interesting question, can we design systems which can learn biology from scratch without any preconception? I think that's a t completely open, interesting question. We have a couple of rules, like in chess. We know some rules for how things are working in cells, but can we teach computer to generate living systems in an artificial way, perhaps using reinforcement learning or some modification thereof. But we, on, on a pedestrian level, we use these techniques to analyze the data so far, but we need to develop them further. Diana, do you have anything to add on the, how does the, maybe on how does computational work uh, play a role in some of the engine design that you're doing? Yeah, we start to see the, the influence of the, of the computation. Uh, uh, currently in, uh, in combustion, you cannot think in terms of research just by doing some experiments or just some computation. So basically it's a joint work and uh, uh, you really need to collaborate or to have people in your group able to approach the same problem from different perspectives. Uh, it's growing up, so the, the, um, the, the, the numerical simulation part and the modeling part is growing up uh, more and more, and, uh, but we still need experiments anyway because there are some uh, phenomena that we are not quite sure. We need to observe <laughs> many things that seem simple, but they are not simple actually. When uh, you want to investigate the noise of a tape, you can buy many tapes. When you want to investigate the behavior of an engine, you cannot buy many gas turbines, it's a bit expensive. <laughs> so you really need to, um, to focus on, on, uh, on uh, experiments, uh, uh, deep experiments uh, associated with these deep calculations. Very good. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, my question is to so Professor Diana, actually, and it has to do with applications. So, if you, um, so you're working on engines, yes. and if you work on a technology where there is uh, like an inherent, inherent uh, thermodynamic limitation, how do you decide between working more on, on this technology versus investing time and money on coming up with something completely different? Yeah, so very this is question. a great question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the second part of my work. So with this simple example of the gas turbine, uh, the first gas turbine that was working was working in 1903 from a researcher in Norway. Since then, we have improved the gas turbine, but always on the same principle. And the, 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 the cycle, the thermodynamic cycle for a gas turbine, uh, you have the combustion or the, the heat input that happen at constant pressure. So that means that for the people that do not remember quite well the class of thermodynamics, you, the, the flame <laughs> that uh, you use to generate the power is the gas turbine. Uh, the flame burns the fuel at constant pressure. But we know since almost more than one century that uh, constant pressure combustion is not the most efficient for a thermodynamic cycle. We know that constant volume combustion is more efficient. So the thermodynamic cycle associated with constant volume combustion are better. But people still going on in trying to improve the gas turbine for almost one century, and now the progress in terms of efficiency, they start to be extremely difficult to achieve. So um, it's time now to think about a different strategy and try to see if it's possible to have a constant uh, volume combustion in a gas turbine. So we start to see some people working on this aspect. I'm one of these people trying to find a way to have constant volume combustion in a gas turbine. If we, but to be successful, we have to convince people that invest billions of US dollars in an engine that it's worth it to spend this money on our ID. We'll see. 
If you haven't had a chance, by the way, I encourage you to go to the Clean Combustion Research Center, especially over in Building 7. You can see a turbine. You can see that it's about 10 meters tall. You can see their constant volume apparatus. We have stuff in our Clean Combustion Research Center that you won't find anywhere else in the world, and that allows her to work on the problem you just asked about. So, any other questions? Yes. Hello. Uh, so some people worry that uh, understanding the human cells too well and being able to engineer them may lead to some uh, like bizarre, unusual phenomena maybe in the future. Do you think those worries are like valid and will we see something like that in our lifetime? That's a very good question and it's difficult to answer specifically, but in, in general, technology are developing and we learn more and more and we know from history that we can use this for good purposes, but we can also misuse it. And that is always the danger with, with technology, and therefore we have to be mindful and, and ask questions like, who is in control of this particular technology? Uh, and because it can be misused, of course. And uh, I think in the grander scheme, uh, we will eventually really learn how to engineer and design cells and build tissues. That is already happening. Uh, but that would be, be even more and more refined with technology, better observation, better simulations. So that is a very good side. We can mo most likely detect diseases earlier. We can have a better prognosis in terms of what happens to medication. And we can also think about regeneration, building tissues, not only cells, to replace, for example, a pancreas, which is damaged for some reason. So that's a very good part. But you can also think on this from the weapon side and, and the really dark side and, and of course there are dangers with uh, I mean people when they explore the atom they wouldn't expect nuclear sort of possibilities in there and we don't really know what to expect when we look deep into the cells so it has two sides and, and we have to ask who is in control of the technology and the knowledge. Yeah, I, I think I would also add there's a design element that's a little bit separate from the science and engineering which is the standards and the ethics so as we develop the technology, the science and the engineering then informs the, the ethical rules that we put in place too. So I think a lot of the research they're doing feeds into that cycle of design as well. That's how we control a lot of this stuff. Any other Hi. questions? Yes. Shaddaa al I was wondering about, is there any people are trying to study the immune system to imitate the, um, how they defend, like for cybersecurity attacks related to that, or is it? You mean uh, taking ideas from the immune yes. system to... Prevent cyber security attacks mm. on well, that, computers. You just a, gave him a research idea. <laughs> <laughs> I want to work on that. <laughs> that, that. That's a very interesting question. Yeah. And for the immune system, we know a lot in terms of the different cells, the molecular mechanisms, what they do. But we still have a very, very faint understanding of the whole system in itself. Early on, there were computer simulations decades ago trying to get to that, but then we had too little detail in terms of knowledge. Now we can sort of ask this question again, how does the immune system as a system work? So on the medical part, can we reprogram and tune the, the immune system to protect against cancer or other diseases? Can we use that for discovery of diseases early on? But we don't understand the system mechanisms of the immune defense. I think it's very viable that there will be principles of that system that we can sort of extract and use in other contexts, similar to what happens inside cells and also in the brain. So I think it's a great source of inspiration to study nature very closely, and we can design new things. But that's a great idea. So I'm, I'm going to steal a question because I want Siggy to explain something. He, he recently developed, using some very simple cameras, a way to do some... You, you did this design yourself. So I want them to know a little bit about this, right? Of, of, yeah. of a complicated <clears throat> system where you engineered some simple so, ways to watch it. Yeah, so in, in my lab we have um, very complicated uh, four high-speed cameras to study three-dimensional turbulent motion. So this comes back to Diana. Uh, how do you understand the flow inside a turbine or something? So these are very, very expensive uh, camera, uh, cameras. So what we did, we, we decided uh, to try to use uh, iPhones. You know. So we can use four iPhones. Actually, what we used was a Nokia phone. It's a 40 megapixel camera. So you can leverage you know, the uh, 
consumer products, because they, are, you know, they make millions of them, so their prices is much lower, if you can use them, if you can develop the mechanisms or the algorithms to use those uh, products, uh, you are ahead of the game because it's, uh, the price is low and also the development is very fast. I mean, a new model comes out every year and you can uh, do it. And now the IT department here, of course, was wondering why is Siki have 12 iPhones <laughs> under his name? You know? <laughs> Does he keep losing these things? So uh, just to ask a little bit more so I can understand it. So particle tracking means you're watching fluids, you're watching movement, and in order to see the flow, you, you add yeah. so reflective... What, what do you do to right. watch it then? So, so we have to add uh, particles in there. Okay. And um, now a cell phone doesn't take many uh, thousand frames per second. Well, some of the new ones do actually take yeah. high-speed images. But the regular one, uh, what we needed to do was follow these particles around. I mean, using the color information to get the time, you know. So we flash with red, green, and blue, and we can see how it moves just using one frame from each camera. Huh. So, that, cool. that, so we are, yeah, we can find out the vortices inside the flow, and that maybe will help your design. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Questions back to the audience. Come on. I know you got more. I saw them out there. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is for Dr. Diana. Uh, you're using plasma flames, right? Uh, plasma flames to uh, actually improve the coupling between the heat release and the acoustic. Can you elaborate more on that? Because my research actually, actually is, is similar to, I'm, I'm working with uh, Professor William in the pulse combustor, so we're working on the uh, constant volume. So can you elaborate more how will the plasma flames enhance or improve uh, the, the coupling between the... Uh, the yes. acoustics and the heat release. So you are a specialist, so I try to have an answer which is not just for you, but for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, why is this coupling important? So just to, to explain the context, in a gas turbine you have a small part where you have combustion. Uh, before the combustion you have compressor that compress the air entering the combustion chamber. And after the combustion chamber you have the turbine that make the, the work, that make the, the, the power of the engine. So um, the flame is turbulent because you want to burn a lot of uh, fuel in a small uh, time, so to, to release a lot of energy. And a turbulent flame is a stable. You have some fluctuation sometimes. And this fluctuation will generate some pressure fluctuation. And the pressure fluctuation, they will travel inside the engine and they will be reflected at the boundary condition of the, um, of the engine. The walls. On the wall. On the walls and also on the, on the outlet. And when they come back, they will increase. They will increase the turbulence. They will increase the the instability of the flame. And then you will have this uh, this problem of a pressure wave going back and forth. And if they couple with the instability of the flame, then you have a resonance, and you have a pressure peak that can completely destroy your engine or at least damage the blade. Usually, you stop the engine at the moment when you see the blade making a strange noise. In your case, you try to uh, use this acoustic wave to confine the flame. Uh, when you use a plasma discharge, you use a spark, basically, that have a different effect. First, you will change uh, the behavior of the flame itself. Second, you will generate other acoustic waves that can counteract the uh, pressure wave generated by the flame. And uh, the last part is that you can change the vorticity and the, the fluid motion inside the engine and change this coupling. Hmm. So I hope I was not too specific in my uh, You guys are answer. all going to walk out of here and be able to explain that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions? I, I have one follow-up related to the engine that maybe is a, a, an easier explanation. So one of the things we try and do in power generation, right, is switch to lower quality fuels for example, right? Yeah. And, and so how do you think about designing an engine with a lower quality fuel where you can get the same energy for a much lower price? 
Yeah, so this is one of the challenges of Saudi Arabia, where we're trying to valorize the uh, uh, heavy fuel oil, so the low quality fuel. Uh, we have a, a, a long uh, research work ahead of us to try to make it uh, really efficient, because this heavy fuel oil, I don't know if you are familiar with that, but they, they, they look like asphalt, they are not liquid, they are just kind of big glue, extremely uh, thick. And to make a flame with that, it's, uh, it's quite challenging, honestly. <laughs> so uh, in our center, I'm not a specialist on that, but in our center, there are many people that are involved in the, in the combustion of uh, heavy fuel oil. It's really a big challenge. And, and if we succeed to do that efficiently, it can completely change the, the future of uh, the way we generate electricity, especially in, uh, in, uh, in the Gulf area, in, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the country around. Um, it's a... Uh, we will have to work closely with the chemist, uh, the fluid mechanics, and also the combustion people uh, mm -hmm. close together to, to be able to make it uh, working. Very good. Any other questions? I know you got a few more. I have one here in the middle. Or you have one on Facebook? Go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, Saeed Aftab asks, can computers be created that interface gracefully with humans? How can augmented cognition be used to sidestep limitations of humans and computers? <laughs> uh, I, yes, I think that's all you. <laughs> <laughs> augmented cognition, yeah. So I think that's going to happen in, in, I mean, already now we have sort of technology interfacing with the human body more than the iPhone or the sensors, but also electrodes on the head that start to sort of realize what you're thinking, what you're doing. So we can already see this interface kind of being tighter and tighter. And, but I don't think we will build in that. I mean, some people have ideas that we're gonna build in sort of chips in the brain and, and, and augment this sort of physical body. That is possible. But alternatively, we can develop smart machines which, which can augment our sort of decisions and, and possibility for understanding complex data without them interfacing the body entirely. But there are people really experimenting with the devices in designing glasses and, and information system and, and so that interface is getting closer. So I think that is one thing that is sort of happening, augmented cognition. We are good at some things, computer good at other things. So I think that, that will merge. Another question here. Hi, thanks all. Uh, my question is about, uh, like, um, Dr. Diana research is uh, based on well-defined needs, and this is the uh, applied research. But uh, talking about the fundamental research, it happens that you do a research, and after 100 or 200 years, that research make a revolution or it might not. So for the uh, researchers in the fundamental research, how, what would you advise or uh, the researcher can do and hope that after some time that research contribute or influence the world? Mm -hmm. how, how, how the researcher or should guide his research if it's a fundamental research? I, I think that's yours, Siggy. Although I would say that as, as a chemist myself, I would put it at maybe 10, 20 years, not 100, 200, okay. but, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Maybe you have some advice, Siggy? Yeah, um, I think we have to have both. We have a very uh, basic research has to continue because we don't know which avenue is going to bring the next big breakthrough. I mean, somebody here earlier, a question was talking about quantum mechanics and, you know, there are things we, we have no clue about, like uh, consciousness and, uh, you know, how is this connected with quantum mechanics. And so uh, I, I would say that uh, you want to have basic research going on and uh, also applied research. So, I, I mean, if you're doing basic research, um, you know, don't, don't be discouraged if <laughs> you... You cannot uh, see the uh, immediate uh, application of that. I mean, if it is, it has to be of, uh, of course, you know, very basic that uh, you're, you're covering new ground, you know. You don't want to be stamp collecting, you know, like they call it. You don't want to be 
covering something that has, like for example with these high-speed video cameras, we are seeing into new time scales which have never been looked at before. So there are always new things that you see and who knows where it's going to be uh, fruitful, you know. That, I guess that would be my answer. Yes, you want to add something? Yeah, I'd like to add two points. I, I agree completely with that and if history has learned us anything is that it pays off. Some things pay off sooner or later, we can't really tell why or when. But second point is that I think even if you do fundamental research, I think it's very useful to early on ask applied questions because that will also help you in your research. So while say doing fundamental research with understanding cells, one can also ask applied questions. How can we use that to detect diseases? How can we use this to make plants more efficient to do this? How can we find inspiration for new computing principles? And how can we design new systems or cells? And we may, that might be the wrong questions to ask, but the point is that by asking applied questions, that informs our fundamental research. It's really a two-way street. So the, the classical view that we do fundamental research X number of years and then later on some applications will happen, that may turn out, yes. But as an individual researcher, I think it's very useful to think about applications, including commercial applications early on. They may be misguided, but it, they inform your way of asking research questions. I think, I think diversity and a, a, the larger research environment plays a role too. I mean, here at KAUST we have an entire group that's working on economic development. We have interdisciplinary research happening where you have you know, people that make materials working with petroleum engineers. So it's also about bringing different perspectives together where you as a fundamental researcher, Siggy as a fundamental researcher, might not take advantage of, of that particular observation, but somebody else sees it from a totally different perspective. Hello, thank you. <coughs> My name is Dominic Siama. I'm the, I'm the dean of a design school. And so I'm going to ask perhaps a, quite a disturbing question. <laughs> uh, because, you know, it's, it's related to the, the ambiguity of the word design. Yes. Okay? The design you are talking is most design engineering, I would say. And the design used for to do science and to improve science. But there is another direction, destination of design, which are the people, okay, actually it's connected to your question, application. And so um, I have two questions. How do you intend or perhaps do use design, but the design I'm talking about, so the design that we are teaching in design schools, to do research, or how do you use design to transform your inventions into applications? Because most of the time, I mean, I know uh, that in most research laboratory, you have scientists, engineers, technicians, but designers, zero, okay? But it's changing. But because there is definitely a, a chance to do science in a different way by integrating design, and also giving perspective to scientific discoveries using designers. So. When are you going to hire designers? <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's going to be brave enough? Who wants to tackle it? I mean, do any of you kind of bring any of that design thinking to the fundamental research like he was asking about? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know if we can directly talk about design because design is something specific you are a specialist on that we are not definitely but anyway the the, um, the beauty of what we are working with uh, trying to uh, uh, communicate our passion about our work uh, go uh, also by the design of our result uh, we uh, here at cost especially we make a strong effort on the, on the communication on the having nice picture of what we are doing or nice illustration of uh, ideas it's not design, I know, but it's in the progress as <laughs> a first step of designing because basically we really need to, what, everything that we are um, uh, working on, at one point uh, we will have to share with other humans and uh, uh, the difference between two uh, different um, solutions, potential solutions, what will make sometimes a difference in one successful and one not successful would be the way we present it and the way we communicate uh, with, uh, with uh, this result. 
talking about graphic design. Yeah. I'm talking about uh, usages, okay? Yeah. Scenario of life, um, functionalities. Uh, you know, uh, take I think I think. Uh, uh, speaking as a, as a chemist myself, I, I think you've identified something that um, academics in general are trying to figure out. I think you've identified maybe a, a challenge to close this session is that what, what we talked about here was engineering, was the very first steps of how do you take fundamental science to an application? How do you start taking it to engineering rules? How do you, uh, how do you adapt and translate? I think there's still an element for all of these panelists and all of our faculty here at KAUST for, for the economic development uh, and innovation department that we have here, we need to be working as universities in general, worldwide, to figure out how we connect that, that further design element to really turn these into products. I think it's a, it's a challenge that maybe we can take forward, and, and if you come back in a year to the Fall Enrichment Program or to one of these in the future, maybe we have better answers to your exact question. I, I can make two comments on that. Uh, so I don't see design directly in the research work, which we do, but I do see design in, in two ways. One is that when we try to sort of develop commercial applications, I started two companies previously, then we need designers for the software design, users, how does it feel, how does it look, is it useful, I is it good, is it bad, regardless of the technical things under the hood. And that's extremely important because if the design is bad, it doesn't matter how smart things you have under the hood. So there, but then in that case, we sort of look for experts to actually do that design. But then we're talking about the innovation commercial arena. And the second thing is, is an observation which I've done recently, is, which I find interesting, is that there's very, very interesting development, development now in design area in the sense of asking the computer to come up with a large number of different designs given some constraints. So it's like enhancing, augmenting our creativity. What are the possible constraints here that minimize the energy consumption or the weight here? Give me all the possible solutions. And that strategy I, th I find very interesting and it's very similar conceptually to what we do in research because we observe the data, we try to figure out what's happening and usually we can come up with some idea this is what's happening but we are usually too limited, so we need augmentation. And that's why we need computers to help us. What are the possible explanations, like in the design case, for these observations to help us to come up with different sort of explanations? And that is conceptually similar to come up with different designs under some kind of constraints. So I, I'm going to close it. It seems like there's a few more questions, but I encourage you to come up and, and ask the panelists afterwards if you want to continue the conversation. Uh, thank you for engaging in the Fall Enrichment Program. Thank you for engaging uh, in this particular panel. Uh, and please thank our panelists for participating. <laughs>